would. But as we look today at uh, cubic functions, we're going to graph cubic functions. Uh, the next one, lesson 115 or 114 maybe? 114, I think. 115, we did 114 on Friday. So this is lesson 115. What we're going to be looking at is cubic functions, and we're going to kind of look at the graphs of these things. All right, and we've already looked at, what are some functions that we've looked at the graphs of? Um, Do you? Quadratics. Quadratics. Um, linear. linear functions. We've looked at quadratic functions. So we've looked at first degree functions. We've looked at second degree functions. We've looked at constant functions, right? A constant function would be like uh, y equals 3. That's a constant function because it's not changing ever. Right? Y equals 3 is really boring. It's a horizontal line through 3. Right? It's no slope of 0. It's not growing. It's just hanging out there. Okay? So that's a constant function. And if we looked at something like y equals 3x, it has a drastically different uh, shape. Right? It has a slope of 3, so it's changing. It's growing. It's doing, and then if we looked at something like y equals 3x squared, again, it changes the shape of the graph, right? And then if we looked at something like y equals 3x cubed, it's going to change the graph again. But how is it going to change? Okay. What's different about cubic functions and quadratic functions that we could talk about based on the theories that we've looked at? All right, so let's, let's kind of do a quick review. That's what a linear function looks like. Point out some characteristics of a linear function. Straight. Yeah? Yeah, it has a constant slope. The rate of change is constant. Right? The slope of this line is 1. Right? The slope of the line we're looking at is 1. It rises 1. It runs 1. It rises 1. It runs 1. The slope is constant. That's an excellent observation. What else can we note about it? Uh, it actually passes through three quadrants, but it's primarily headed in the direction of two quadrants, right? It's going to be up. The, so what else do we know here? Buster? It only has one solution, right? And the solutions on the graph are identified as what? X-intercepts. There's only one X-intercepts. Now, do all lines have X-intercepts? No, they don't. Like, uh... A horizontal line that doesn't go through the origin doesn't have an x-intercept. But every other line, except for a horizontal line, will have an x-intercept, right? Somewhere, somehow, it has one solution. And we would expect that because it's what, what's its degree? First degree, and we would expect a first degree uh, equation in one variable to have one solution. Okay, the reason that a horizontal line doesn't have a solution is because it doesn't have the x variable. Right? If it doesn't have an x value, then how is it going to have an x intercept? All right. Um, okay. So then we looked at what's the next degree up? Second degree, quadratic expression. Observations here. We just compared a lot of things about the uh, 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 linear function. What, what can we see about this? What's, it has two zeros or... No zeros or one zero, depending on where it is, right? But it has two solutions in some field, right? If, if, if the discriminant is negative, we talked about the discriminant. If the discriminant is negative, then it has no real solutions, but it still has two imaginary solutions. Uh, but if it has no real solutions, it's not going to cross the real x-axis, and it's going to have no solutions. All right, what, what are some other things we notice here? It's curved instead of straight which means the rate of change is varying, right? It's increasing at different rates at different places on the graph, right? Because it's curved, the slope isn't constant. The thing that makes a line straight is that its rate of change is constant. Everywhere on the line, the slope is the same. The rate of change is the same, okay? Now, what kind of differences, before we actually graph the cubic function, what kind of differences could we expect? You could have some parts where it's straight and where it's curved. Mm. It could be a circle. No, it can't be a circle. 
three solutions, right? So if we were looking at this, everybody listen and pay attention and avoid the uh, temptation to attempt to be funny. Um, a cubic function can have three zeros. Now, it wouldn't have to look like this. It wouldn't have to look like this. Okay, but, you know, it's going to have three, up to three x-intercepts, three solutions, three roots, three zeros. It could look uh, like this. I mean, it could come down and have these same three zeros. It could look like this. Okay, but let me ask you this. Could it ever come back down over here and touch again? No. Why not? Because it would have to be a fourth degree solution in order to do that. Okay, so if we can cross the x-axis three times, that determines what our shape is always going to look like, right? It's going to go down and then up and then down again, and that's all it can do. It can't come up again. So the shape of a cubic function is always going to look the same, just like a quadratic function always has the same shape. Now, what it does in the middle could be different, but what it does on the outsides is always going to be the same. It's always going to be, go up on one end and down on the other end. Up on one end and down on the other end. That's what a cubic function is always going to look like. Now, what did the quadratic function look like? It always ended up going up on both ends or down on both ends because it can only go through it twice. So it comes down, it has to go back up, and then it can't come back down again because then it would have to be a cubic function. So this is what those highest exponents are doing to the graphs of these functions. Okay. Now, let me ask you something else. Let me just point out something else that we've talked about. Does a quadratic equation have to have a real solution? No. No. Does a cubic function have to have a real solution? No. no. Yes. I'm hearing people say yes and hearing people say no. Can anybody justify their answer? No. Flowers? Well, if, one, if both ends are going in opposite directions, it has to touch the x-axis at some point. Right. Because both ends are going in opposite direction, one's going down and one's going up, it has to uh, touch the axis at some point. Now, what's another fact that I just gave you just about three or four minutes ago that should help you know that it will always have a real solution? Imaginary solutions come in pairs. So can we have three imaginary solutions? No. We cannot. Okay? We can't have three imaginary solutions, which means one of the three solutions to this third degree polynomial has to be real. All right? So algebraically reasoning, what we know about polynomials, what we know about the fundamental theorem of algebra, those things come into play when we're dealing with these polynomial functions. Brent? Do you graph imaginary numbers the same way you do normal numbers? You do, you do not. And you'll get into that in uh, um, advanced math, college algebra, college trig. We'll, you'll advance. It's, it's uh, complex numbers, a different plane. Yes. So I noticed when I was graphing <clears throat> like higher exponents, it always followed the same pattern. Like every even exponent was like a parabola shape, and every odd was like that shape. And we should expect that, right? It starts out that way. Odd degree, odd degree. You know, one end is up, one end is down. So first degree functions, down and up. And the line, if you the only th the only other thing it could do is go, you know down and then up, negative slope instead of positive slope. Um, this one is going to either do this, or if you turn it upside down, what's it going to do? It's going to look left. And then the cubic function is going to always look like this. The cubic function is going to always go um, up on one end and down on the other end. And then it starts repeating itself x to the fourth looks like this, x to the fifth looks like this, x to the sixth looks like this, x to the seventh looks like that again. All right. Now what it does in the middle, an x to the seventh, for example, could touch the x-axis seven times, but on the outsides it's going up and down, you know, so um, this is kind of like an even function, you know, an odd function is what we do odd function, 
even function. Both hands doing the same thing, it's an even function. If both hands are doing opposite things, it's an odd function. Um, and that's not the, now listen, everybody listen, listen, you're, you're missing something trying to be funny again. The even and odd technical definition of an even and odd function is a little bit more complicated than that. Um, but I'm talking about even powered functions, even degree functions. All right, so sixth, sixth degree functions look like second degree functions, look like fourth degree functions on the ends where, where the function counts. Okay, all right, <clears throat> so let's make some observations here. Um, an nth degree polynomial function can have up to n real solutions, also called x intercepts, zeros or roots, okay? Graphically, we can call these things different, different numbers, right? Different things that can take on different names. Odd degree polynomial functions must have at least one real root, and why did we establish that odd powered functions have to have one real root? Imaginary solutions to polynomial functions come in conjugate pairs, right? So if it has one imaginary solution, it has two. Okay, um, and that's a couple of facts that we need to know. This is some pretty advanced algebra theory here. All right, so evaluate the cubic parent function y equals x cubed and the function y equals negative x cubed for those x values and graph the two functions. Now what are they telling us to do here? Make a table of values using these domain values and then just plot the points to see what it's going to look like. So, so let's do that. Let's take this and we'll do y equals x cubed on this side and they want us to do y equals negative x cubed over here. Let's do a different color for that. You ought to be writing. Don't, don't let it get ahead of you. So we're going to plug in x values and get y values out. They gave us the x values that they want us to use. Remember, this is the most basic rudimentary skill for factoring is to um, pick values and plot points. So the points that they want us to pick here, focus buddy, are negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2 in both cases. Now, kind of as a general rule, guys, <clears throat> The higher the degree the function is, the more points you have to pick to determine the shape. Because the shapes get a little bit more complicated um, as you get higher powers, especially if there's other degrees available. If there's an x squared along with this x cubed, it really does affect the shape for small values of x, values that are close to zero. But for big values of x, the cube wins. The cube over, overpowers the square. The square eventually becomes insignificant. Okay? Um, so what do we get if we cube negative 2 on the left here? Negative 2 cubed is negative 8. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1. 0 cubed is 0. 1 cubed is 1. 2 cubed is 8. And what I've generated here is points that I can use to determine the shape of this graph. Now what's going to change over here if I just put an extra negative in for my y value? The, the, this becomes positive 8, this becomes positive 1, 0 stays the same, this becomes negative 1, and this becomes negative 8. All right. So if I look at the graphs then, if I plot these points here, and I'm just going to not be real super detailed, but let's do y equals x cubed. Negative 2 goes to negative 8. Negative 1 is negative 1. 0 is 0. 1 is 1. And 2 is 8. And it has this curved shape to it, like this. That's what y equals x cubed looks like. All right, y equals negative x cubed. Uh, negative 2 goes to positive 8. It's too far over. Let's go there. Negative 1 goes to positive 1. 0 stays at 0. Then we go here and here. And the shape of the graph looks like this. 
So really y equals negative x cubed is just kind of a flip it, rotate it around the axis is what we do there. Uh, flip it down and it becomes that. All right, so that's what those two graphs would look like. Now you could examine any of those graphs, any uh, power function, by picking points and plugging them in, finding the shape of the graph by plotting the points. Okay? If this says solve by graphing, we're going to do it uh, differently. Excuse me, I didn't mean to switch out of that. What I want to do here is take this algebraically. I want to challenge you guys to solve a few of these algebraically. Graphing, if we're going to use graphing, we're going to use our graphing calculators and get as close to exact as possible. We're not going to do a crude graph by hand to solve by graphing when we have a graphing utility that we can use to get an exact answer. You should be writing this down already. Zero equals x cubed minus one. How would we solve this, you think, algebraically? Any ideas? Why? You want to get the x value by itself, right? So it's kind of like the property of squares. We can solve a square. If we can get something squared equals a number and take the square root. If we can get the cube part isolated by adding 1 to both sides, and I get 1 equals x cubed. Okay. X is equal to the cube root of 1. We can solve that, uh, and because we know the cube root of 1, uh, I don't have to use any kind of tricks to do the calculator. We get this, and that gives us the solution of X equals 1. Right? And that's pretty simple. How do we find the other two solutions? So here's the deal, guys. I'm throwing this out there. Let it stick. You guys at the end of your Algebra 1 class, there's three, there's three cube roots of 1. How many square roots of 4 are there? 2, right? It has a positive root and it has a negative root. 1 has three roots. One is real, two are imaginary. So there's two imaginary numbers that you can cube to get positive one. All right? I'm not going to. Yeah, I am. If I take this original equation, and uh, Jackson, if we factor it, I didn't teach you how to do this. But the factorization of this, I've taught Jackson, is this. That's how you factor cubes. There's a pattern there. It's not difficult at all. Here we can see the 0, x equals 1, right? Because if you, that's the value that make that 0. And we could solve this by doing x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. That's the two imaginary solutions. And those happen to be the two imaginary cube roots of 1. Because all of my solutions come from cube roots of 1. So 3 has, excuse me, every number other than 0 has 3 cube roots. Just like every number other than 0, every real number other than 0 has 2 square roots. Okay? for what it's worth. All right, how would we solve this one? <clears throat> we got to hurry. Add 7 to both sides. And that gives us 9 equals negative 2x cubed. Then what would we do? Divide by negative 2. So negative 9 over 2 equals x cubed. Right, which means x equals the cube root of negative 9 over 2. The cube root of negative 4.5. In your calculator, parentheses, negative 4.5, raised to the one-third power. 
because one third power is the cube root. Okay? Now, we could use the zero function, second trace, go to number three to find the zeros of these if we wanted to. Uh, and we could do that to solve by graphing on a graphing calculator. Now, the way we would do that here is, first of all, we would have to get this in what form? <clears throat> Standard form of this would be, if I add 2x squared to both sides, y'all pay attention, I know I'm going quickly, we're running out of time this short class period, I would get that. Okay. Now, if you take the graph of this in your graphing calculator, y equals 1 half x cubed plus, three, plus 2x squared, minus 1. If you graph that, is anybody working along with me on this? George is, I bet. And I just put all of that in. Okay. Now, if you graph it, how many zeros does it have? Three. It, it looks like it crosses the x-axis three times. So you could find all three of those zeros by using the second trace. I think three would give you the zeros, left and right of the zero, and guess, and it'll tell you what the zero is. So we could do it graphically. Now, here's kind of a weird application to this. Cubes have a, an application in real life to volume, right? Cubic units related to volume. So a cube of pure gold weighing 100 pounds would have a volume of about 143 cubic inches. This says use a graphing calculator to estimate the side length of a 100-pound gold cube of gold. Now, why would we use a graphing calculator to do that? I wouldn't. The area, or excuse me, the volume of this cube is S cubed. That's the formula for the volume of a cube. Side times side times side. Length times width times height, but it's a cube, so all of the dimensions are the same. S cubed equals 143. S equals what? The cube root of 143. And on the calculator, that is 143 raised to the 1 third power and you can determine what that value would be. Okay? There's your homework. It's not A through 3. That's A through E. A through E. All right. You guys have a great day. Enjoy your lunch.